on the 9th, 16th and 23rd of November 2003, respectively, the three episodes of Sea Monsters, A Walking with Dinosaurs trilogy were released. Also known as Chased by Sea Monsters in North America, or just simply Sea Monsters, it was yet another special in the Walking With series produced by Impossible Pictures, focusing on extinct marine life. Unlike the previous Walking With Cavemen, this series was created by the two founders of the company and the heart and soul of Walking With, Jasper James acting as director and Tim Haynes as executive producer, alongside Adam Kemp. The presentation is very reminiscent to that of Chased by Dinosaurs, with CGI prehistoric creatures composited on top of real life backdrops, alongside the man, the myth, the legend himself, wildlife presenter Nigel Marvin. The structure of sea monsters, however, is very unique for walking with, as it is framed as Nigel travelling back and forth through time to dive in the seven deadliest seas of all time, spread across three 30-minute episodes. These seven seas are seven time periods from across the Phanerozoic Eon, ranked from least to most deadly by the show, based on the creatures present. Whilst I normally don't like when extinct animals are portrayed as incredibly deadly, as it feels overly dramatised and misleading most of the time, Sea Monsters does it so incredibly well and without being over the top. Sea Monsters is unique for walking with in another way in that it is the only viewing experience I've had with these shows where I experience genuine feelings of fear and dread, but I mean this in the best way possible. It fully capitalises on the common fear of the deep ocean and the possible giant monsters it may hide. The difference here being that the sea monsters were once actual living animals, so just be aware that if you have fairly intense thalassophobia, this show may not be for you. The time periods for the seven deadly seas are as follows. The Ordovician, Triassic, Devonian, Eocene, Pliocene, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Of these seven, two are brand new for walking with, the Ordovician and Devonian. These mark the first time we see them tackle the Paleozoic era, before giving it its due diligence in the form of a full dedicated series two years later with Walking With Monsters. The other five time periods, despite being covered in the other shows in some capacity and sometimes reusing creatures from them, all feature at least one brand new creature, so it's far from just recycling older content. Without further ado, let's quite literally dive in and see how well Sea Monsters holds up 20 years later. Episode 1, Dangerous Seas, whose title isn't shown in the actual program for some reason, showcases Nigel travelling to the 7th, 6th and 5th deadliest seas, the Ordovician, Triassic and Devonian respectively, with the latter being split across episodes 1 and 2. The Pliocene is also split across episodes 2 and 3, and are why I opted to do one big video on sea monsters. This episode starts out with a really cool throwback to Chased by Dinosaurs, featuring a mix of scenes of Nigel being, well, chased by dinosaurs, with some scenes and footage that went unused in the final programs. Interestingly, despite being presented and narrated by Nigel, there is additional narration by Karen Haley in the UK version and Christopher Cook in the US version. I'm not sure why they had two narrators. It's not a problem or anything, it's just an interesting choice. There is also an entirely original scene involving the Tarbosaurus from the Giant Claw chasing Nigel towards the sea. The narration teases how Nigel has already had some close scrapes with dinosaurs, but that he's about to find out that in prehistory, no matter how bad things get on land, the one thing you should never ever do is get in the water. Cornered between the Tarbosaurus and the ocean, Nigel takes the plunge, giving us some really cool blurry glimpses of some of the creatures we'll see later, both in front and behind Nigel. The titles appear and Nigel surfaces to breathe. Such an awesome intro, aided massively by the amazing score by Ben Bartlett. Speaking of the score, the sound design of Sea Monsters is superbly unsettling and it is incredible. 
Similar to how in the Walking With Dinosaurs episode, Cruel Sea, Bartlett used many samples from the album Distorted Reality by Spectrasonics. Similar samples are used here, and the additional tension and dread they incite is so palpable and really enhances the entire viewing experience and tone Sea Monsters was going for. After the opening, we see Nigel aboard the time-travelling boat, the Ancient Mariner, below an awesome cloud time-lapse shot. How and or why this boat can travel through time is never explained because it doesn't really matter. You just accept it as the, quite literal, vehicle to get to the prehistoric creatures. I'm also very sorry, but I'm about to point out something silly in this scene that will make it so you will never be able to unsee it. If you look closely at Nigel's arm, he misses the railing before fumbling to grab it again. We then get a brief introduction to the Seven Deadly Seas, showing short clips of the awesome creatures of the deep we're about to see. I love the water effect on the numbers in this show. It's only a small touch, but it just looks so cool to me and I love it. Strangely, the appearance of the Cretaceous segment here differs from its actual appearance in Episode 3 in two ways. The first is that the scene itself does not feature in Episode 3 at all, and the second is that there is no beige filter over the footage. We then get our first look at perhaps my favourite aspect of Sea Monsters, the time map. It's exactly what it says on the tin, it's a map for geological time. It comes in two forms. The first is the physical prop Nigel uses in the show. It has an awesome, old-fashioned, parchment-esque look, like that of old sailing maps, featuring both images of the CGI models from the series, as well as other pieces of paleo art and rough maps of the globe for the featured time periods. Significant events such as the mass extinctions and ice ages are also included. This version was actually printed in the tie-in book Sea Monsters Prehistoric Predators of the Deep, written by director Jasper James and Nigel himself, but it was split across several pages. My very good friend Ancient Realms made a more complete and comprehensive version seen here of the one from the book, as well as a version that includes additional creatures from Walking With Monsters. The second form of the time map is that of a CG visual for the audience, with the physical version of the map acting as the ground in the middle of space, featuring the actual CGI models of the creatures standing or floating above. The skyscrapers at the end when you get to the present is such a cool addition. The sound design is amazing as various animal sounds can be heard echoing most notably whale songs coupled with an amalgamation of tense, sharp and droning music samples. Words cannot express how much I love this visual. It's just so fun to look at and I find myself getting lost in it every time. The Cambrian period isn't included, nor is any of the pre-Cambrian, but that's likely because no creatures from either of those times had been made by Impossible Pictures yet. For the first sea, we travel to the point furthest back on the map, the late Ordovician period, 450 million years ago. Sea Monsters also introduces the on-screen stats for the time period visited, including the name, geological age, and hazards. These would persist in Walking With Monsters. I have mixed feelings about these. Whilst it's handy the info appears so quickly and is brief and digestible for laymen, I feel it could have just been done with narration, and the hazards part I feel kind of spoils the creatures a little bit. It's not a huge deal, just maybe a bit unnecessary, in my opinion. They may be a result of the faster pace of this show and monsters, trying to spend as little time explaining with narration, as both cover several time periods in an episode, as opposed to the single time period per episode of the previous shows. <sighs> Cavemen doesn't count. The amazing sound design continues as the stats are joined by distorted whale calls, and they sound so cool. This is then followed by a constant but very subtle droning wind-like white noise as the music kicks in. Strangely, the episode doesn't state where the Ordovician segment is set, neither in the stats or narration. The only way to find this info is from the tie-in book, which states it is set in the state of New York. I must admit, my knowledge of the early Paleozoic is quite patchy and is not my forte as far as paleontology is concerned, so my apologies if this segment isn't as informative scientifically. 
The Ordovician segment and its creatures are often accompanied by this certain deep chirping ambience that I've been struggling to ID. So if anybody knows what this odd sound is, please do let me know in the comments. This segment was filmed in and around the coast of the Red Sea in Egypt, and apparently the crew had to avoid the Egyptian military police whilst filming. Despite the area being known for its beautiful coral reefs, Jasper James explained in the behind the scenes that they actually filmed there when the coral was all dead to better fit the aesthetic of the Ordovician, and I think they nailed it. Considering the nature of both the Red Sea's expansive coral reefs and coastal deserts, it provides the perfect filming location for the Ordovician, as Nigel explains that there are no land plants and therefore, the rate at which carbon dioxide is being removed from, and oxygen is being pumped into, the atmosphere as a byproduct of photosynthesis is substantially lower than today. This much less hospitable atmosphere necessitates bringing a special air mix, which we see Nigel and his team breathing from in this segment. This, however, could be interpreted as untrue. I see this as it's unclear whether Nigel is referring to this area specifically, or to land in the Ordovician in general. The oldest known fossil spores of land plants are dated to the Middle Ordovician, and most likely would have resembled liverworts, which are still alive today, clinging to rocks at the water's edge. So if it's the latter, Nigel, you are telling fibs. We get some cool shots of the rocky coastline as Nigel heads to the beach. They make an interesting point that Ordovician beaches would have had next to no scavengers, so any corpses or debris would just lie on the shore rotting and drying in the sun. Notice how there are corpses of horseshoe crabs, which were around way back then and still are today, almost half a billion years later. Among the corpses, Nigel skewers an armor-plated fish, which, like all of the Ordovician creatures for some reason, are not given a specific genus name in the show, but the tie-in book clarifies that this is a Strasbis, which wasn't known from New York specifically, but was known from Colorado and Wyoming, all of which were covered in shallow inland seas during the Ordovician, as sea levels were extremely high. It was a small, jawless fish with armor plating on its head, composed of similar substances to teeth and a cartilaginous tail, but no fins. Its name means star shield, after the star shapes the tubercles that make up its armor have. Its closest living relatives are the only jawless fish still alive today, the hagfish and the nightmarish looking parasitic lampreys. Its armor was thought to have been for both protection against predators and for mineral storage. It seems to only be portrayed by a puppet. We never get a good look at it in the show, and we never see a live one, but the photo in the book looks to be pretty much perfect, with a neat color scheme to boot. Nigel uses the Astraspis as bait for a carnivorous animal, a sea scorpion. This is the common name for a group of extinct arthropods known as Eurypterids. They were a successful and diverse group that first evolved in the Ordovician and persisted until the end of the Permian period around 253 million years ago when they became extinct. Despite the name, it is thought that their closest relatives were in fact not true scorpions, but rather the horseshoe crabs in the group Chelicerata. Whilst not named in the episode, the book confirms that this particular genus is Megalograptus. Like Astraspis, it too is not known from New York specifically, but from the other US states of Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Its name means Great Writing as it was originally misinterpreted as a graptolite, a group of floating animals that formed colonies and filtered food from the water that first evolved in the Cambrian period and are still around today, existing for over half a billion years, and who are also named after the Greek word graptos, meaning writing. Even 20 years later, this reconstruction of Megalograptus is pretty much flawless. Nigel states that unlike modern true scorpions, Eurypterids had no venom in their tails, which were thought to be mainly used as a paddle for swimming in most genera. It really is amazing just how accurate and lifelike both the CG model and animatronic are. The latter is made especially evident whilst Nigel is holding the prop when he plucks it from the water, writhing in his hands, before he throws it back and it smoothly transitions to CG. It is magnificent. After devouring the Astraspis, the scorpion then decides to attack Nigel, giving him what zoologists refer to as a badge of courage. Also, notice how Nigel's hat seems to reappear in this shot, but then is gone again. 
We then see Nigel salvage the corpse of an enormous trilobite, the book IDs as the genus Isotelus, one of the largest known, which Nigel also states here, trilobites were an extremely successful group of aquatic, detritivorous arthropods, first evolving in the Cambrian period, and persisting throughout the rest of the Paleozoic era, and are among the most common animal fossils in the world. Isotelus is only represented by a puppet, but it looks fantastic, and pretty much perfect as far as I can tell. Nigel then states he is going to use it as bait for larger predators out in deeper water, and decides to pop out one of its eyes to stick a camera in it to get a good look at any predators that may be attracted. Seems a bit needlessly invasive, Nigel, but okay. I do love how the cameraman looks away as Nigel does the deed. Nigel then touches upon something many paleodocs don't seem to mention that often. Because the Earth's rotation has been, and still is, gradually slowing down since its formation, day length slowly increases as it takes the planet longer to complete one full rotation on its own axis. This has resulted in modern day lengths of 24 hours, but in the Ordovician, the Earth would have been spinning much faster, resulting closer to 21 hour days. The book touches upon how a human being in this time would suffer from extremely rough jet lag for several days, if not weeks, due to the human body clock not being adapted to such short days. A very interesting thing to think about, and I appreciate Sea Monsters for mentioning it. We get a wonderful shot of the sunset and the team setting up camp for the night. The next day, Nigel sets out in a dinghy to search for bigger sea monsters. He ironically wears an armoured shark suit before sharks evolved for protection. I love this one shot of this sea scorpion just ambling towards Nigel, pushing the boat out. After heading into deeper water, Nigel throws the trilobite cam into the water. The first animal to arrive is a sea scorpion, from which we get a grotesque but wonderfully done close-up as it feeds. What's cool is that we have coprolites, that is, fossil dung, from Megalograptus that showed they did actually feed on Isotelus. After dissuading the scorpion, the bait is later fed upon by a much larger predator that ends up taking the trilobite and, inadvertently, the camera. Nigel excitedly gears up and dives in to see this new creature. Interestingly, as he follows the cable, he not only finds the frayed remnants at the end where the trilobite once was, but also a shoal of sea scorpions all heading in the same direction. Nigel then spots the mystery predator, which he calls an orthocone. Strictly speaking, orthocone only refers to the shape of the shell, which is shared across several groups of cephalopods, some of which are only distantly related. The book explains that orthocone can also be treated as shorthand for orthoconic nautiloids, as they are indeed most closely related to the modern day nautiluses. The book also specifies that this animal is the genus Camaroceras. Its name means chambered horn and is portrayed as being around 11 meters long. However, this is now thought to be incorrect. This measurement is based on an allegedly 9 meter long shell, as this is the only part of these animals that fossilizes, but this specimen was destroyed. The largest specimens that are still intact are now referred to the genus Endoceras, so this depiction may in fact be this genus instead. Both genera are known from New York though. The model looks amazing, and it is beautifully animated, even if it is probably way too big. Nigel even comments on the wonderful texture of its shell. What's quite surprising though is that this model from 20 years ago is actually slightly more accurate than the one from the documentary series Life on Our Planet, which only came out a month ago. But I'll talk about that when I get around to making a video on that show at some point. Both Camaroceras and Endoceras are in the nautiloid family Endoceratidae and are thought to have been ambush predators that lived close to the seabed. There has been much debate over how active they were in terms of swimming, with some of the larger species even being suggested as laying on the seabed waiting to ambush prey. It is also shown swimming with its shell mostly horizontal, but it is now thought that they would have swum with their shells much more vertical perhaps even crawling across the seafloor with their arms. 
The autocone then approaches Nigel, who discourages it by flashing his light across its eyes. He later states that they most likely spend most of their time in deep, dark water, meaning their vision is poor and instead rely on smell to find prey. It then detects a sea scorpion, and an awesome detail is that you see its siphon change direction to propel it forward for the attack, just like modern cephalopods. It grabs the scorpion with its arms and pulls it back to a keratinous beak that crushes the prey to then be scooped out by the toothy radula. In the background of some of the underwater shots, some strange floating silhouettes can sometimes be seen. I don't know what these are meant to be, but it's possible they are graptolites. I think this is because they are mentioned in the book and seem like a fitting candidate given their appearance. Nigel then decides the best thing to do is to grab onto the orthocomb shell and hitch a ride? As it drags him deeper, he comes to his senses and returns to the surface, but not before having his shark suit tested by a sea scorpion. Upon returning to shore, we see that the sea scorpions from earlier were all moving towards the shore to take advantage of the high tide from the full moon to spawn, much like modern horseshoe crabs. With Nigel explaining how some Megalograptus fossils have been found with smaller individuals within the stomachs of adults, showing that some would cannibalise the hatchlings. I love that when he gets out of the boat, Nigel just grabs this one scorpion and just yeets it for no reason. Its brethren get revenge though by popping his dinghy, wrapping up the Ordovician segment. I like this part, and I think it's quite interesting, as well as informative, and it's really cool seeing the Impossible Pictures team tackle the Paleozoic. Considering neither the sea scorpions or the orthocones really pose that much of a threat to a human, I feel it's definitely the least deadly of the seven, so I agree with its placement. Interestingly, in the following Silurian period, much larger sea scorpions had evolved, including Pterygotus, which we will later see in Walking with Monsters, and Acutiramus, which may have actually posed some threat to a person, so perhaps that period would have been a more appropriate choice for the show. The next deadly sea is the Triassic, and oh boy, in terms of accuracy, this segment in particular is all over the place. This segment is set 230 million years ago, which would place it in the late Triassic. I believe this segment was filmed off the coast of New Zealand, as were many parts of this show, but I'm not certain about that. Whilst not mentioned in the episode, the book states that this part is set in Switzerland, leading me to believe it is based on fauna from the Bassano Formation. This, however, is immediately problematic. For starters, the first two creatures we see are kind of returning faces from walking with dinosaurs, but also kind of not. They're also not even sea monsters, they're both just background terrestrial creatures pretty much. The first is an unnamed dinosaur, which is clearly just a recoloured Coelophysis, which supplementary material, such as the book and the old website, refers to as a Coelurosaur. I don't have any proof of this, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was some kind of miscommunication during production, as Coelurosaur sounds very similar to Coelosaurus, a reptile very closely related to dinosaurs, and may even be a dinosaur known from nearby Poland. If this is meant to be this genus, then it is now thought to actually be quadrupedal, so the Coelophysis model is not a great stand-in, but I appreciate that the producers most likely wanted to give the audience a glimpse of a more familiar group of animals before giving us the wonderful Triassic weirdos later. Speaking of, I made a video talking in great detail about a whole bunch of these guys, which you can watch by following this link right here if you're interested. Even if this is a dinosaur, it is extremely unlikely that it would be a Coelurosaur. Coelurosaurs are a highly derived group of theropod dinosaurs that includes birds and all taxa more closely related to them than other dinosaurs, and are thought to have first appeared during the Middle Jurassic. It is therefore very unlikely that such a derived clade would be present by this point in their evolution, and the Coelophysis stand-in was not a member of Coelurosauria. So overall, I really don't know what to think of this thing, and it's barely even in the show, and yet it's melted my brain a little bit. Our second background reappearance, if you can call it that, is Patinosaurus, which also goes unnamed. 
It appears twice in these shows and neither time is it in the right place. It is only known from Italy, but in New Blood it was shown in Arizona and now it's at least closer in Switzerland. The oldest known pterosaurs, however, are known from closer to 220 million years ago, so it's possible they haven't evolved yet, but there could be older specimens awaiting discovery. If this is meant to be a Patinosaurus itself though, then it shouldn't be here. Okay, so after the two background land creatures gave me a bit of a headache, Nigel sails out to sea in the Ancient Mariner and spots a Nothosaur surfacing to breathe with his binoculars. Something really cool about this show is that Nigel uses a different defense method for every sea, with one or maybe two exceptions. For the Triassic, he brings an electric cattle prod, which I don't know how that works underwater. If any of you know better than me, please let me know in the comments. Whilst he states that the Nothosaurs may not be too dangerous, he alludes to other Triassic sea monsters that could easily kill a person. When Nigel dives in, he finds there's in fact a pair of Nothosaurs. Whilst not stated in the episode, the complete guide to prehistoric life IDs them as the genus Nothosaurus, which is known from the Bassano Formation. Their name means false lizard, and they were closely related to the more famous plesiosaurs, but differed in that they had functional legs and were presumed to be amphibious, essentially being reptilian seals. These things look incredible, accurate and beautifully animated and implemented into the environment, with wonderful details such as kicking up sand as they swim by. I genuinely have no notes on these things, they are simply magnificent. The genus Neustichosaurus also appears in the book and is referred to as a small species of Nothosaur, but it has since been reclassified. Nigel decides he wants another ride on a sea monster as he grabs a Nothosaur by its jaws, clamping the air-breathing reptile's mouth shut, making it panic and most likely use up a lot of oxygen. When he lets it go, it makes a very interesting noise. Or maybe it's a different creature we don't see. Whilst this concludes their appearance in the episode, what is really interesting about the Nothosaurs is that the book shows several production photographs of not only the puppet on land, but also Nigel in front of Nothosaur eggs in a nest on land. This is merely speculation on my part, but I wouldn't be surprised if they filmed, or at least planned, a sequence where the Nothosaurs return to the land to lay their eggs. In the book, when the young Nothosaurs hatch and make their dangerous trek to the sea like modern sea turtles, many of them are eaten by the quote-unquote Coelurosaurs, as well as two other creatures that don't appear in the episode, an unnamed Cynodont, which are not known from Bassano, and the Temnospondyl amphibian Mastodonsaurus, also unknown from Bassano. This could be interpreted as a remnant of this possibly scrapped scene. Maybe they cut this in favour of the similar storyline with the spawning sea scorpions in the Ordovician. There is some evidence later that this may have been the case, as in the second episode, at the end of the Devonian segment, a crew member can be seen crossing off the first three seas on a whiteboard, and the Triassic is at the top, rather than the Ordovician, suggesting that at some point during production, the Triassic was planned to be the first sea, and the spawning storyline was intended for the first sea. It's also possible this is just a goof, and someone wrote them in the wrong order. Either way, it's interesting to speculate. Going back to the episode, Nigel comes across the utterly bizarre Tanistrophius, whose name means long hinged. I talk about this animal in a lot of detail in my aforementioned Triassic Weirdos video, so I'll keep this brief. Let's address the elephant in the room. Nigel sneaks up behind the creature and grabs its tail, to which the creature responds by panicking and dropping its tail like a modern lizard. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest Tanistrophius was capable of autotomy, as far as I can tell. That isn't to say it's impossible, however, it is very possible Nigel just ripped off the tail of an innocent Tanistrophius. Interestingly, it is shown swimming with only its hind limbs, similar to a frog, which was found to be supported by studies published years after the show aired so they may have made a really good guess. The model itself looks wonderful and derpy. The green iguana colour scheme I'm sure is no accident considering the lizard-like tail dropping. The detached, spasming Tanistrophius tail puppet is then yanked from Nigel's hand by the huge basal ichthyosaur Symbospondylus. 
Its name means boat vertebrae and the model looks superb and pretty much perfect in terms of accuracy. However, its behaviour portrayed here may be questionable. Its teeth were small and conical, with stomach contents found within the specimens from Switzerland showing that they fed on squid and ammonites, but this does not exclude larger prey. Other similar sized Triassic ichthyosaurs discovered after the show aired, such as the Lato Archon from Middle Triassic Nevada and Guizhou Ichthyosaurus from Late Triassic China, with the latter being previously classified as a species of Symbospondylus and being found with an almost complete Gymposaurus, a 4 meter long marine reptile, within its stomach. The lack of signs of digestion suggests that the animal died soon after swallowing this huge prey, so it's very possible Symbospondylus also sometimes fed on much larger prey. After swallowing the tanny's tail, the ichthyosaur then sinisterly encircles Nigel. He uses the electric prod to fend off the first sea monster we've seen so far that seems to pose a significant threat to a person. Okay, so Ben Bartlett's music is always wonderful, but I have to say, I was not expecting an electric guitar in one of his pieces, but it is awesome. After Nigel zaps it a few times with the electric prod, the Symbospondylus swims off. We actually never see Nigel return to the boats, as it just transitions from the Symbospondylus back to the time map, concluding the Triassic segment. Like I said at the beginning, the accuracy of the segment is a bit shaky. The quote-unquote Coelurosaur and Patinosaurus at the beginning aside, all the other creatures are native to the Bassano Formation of Switzerland. However, the formation itself is dated from 247 to 237 million years ago, making it and all its fauna much older than this part's setting of 230 million years ago. This issue could be resolved either by changing the time to 240 million years ago and cutting out the two landlubbers. As for the actual sea monsters, the Nothosaurs are perfect, the Symbospondylus is anatomically perfect, and potentially so behaviourally, and the Tanistrophius is, weirdly, very accurate too, somehow. Except of course for the tail dropping, which, again, no evidence for, but I suppose it's not impossible. Despite the accuracy and time issues, I'm a sucker for the Triassic period, and I still really enjoy this segment. The fifth deadliest sea is the Devonian period, the second brand new time period for walking with. This sea marks the only time the stats are not shown immediately after arriving in the time period. Instead, this segment starts out with Nigel looking at the real-life time map prop in the cabins of the Ancient Mariner, and it looks magnificent. He reflects on his first two dives and teases that the third is the Age of Giant Armoured Fish. We then get the stats for the Devonian, set 360 million years ago, close to the end of the period. The book states that this part is set in present day Ohio, and whilst I'm not certain where it was filmed, it was possibly done in the Bahamas and or New Zealand. This segment also marks the only time a reconnaissance dive is performed by an unguarded cameraman, mind you, who managed to film a Dunkleosteus unharmed somehow. When Nigel and the crew watch the recorded footage, on good old VHS, we get our view of the huge armoured predatory fish. What's interesting to note is that in some versions of the show made for different languages, the shots seen only on the small TV here are shown as normal full screen versions. I wonder why these weren't included in the English version. Regardless, Dunkleosteus was a type of fish known as placoderms. Placoderms were the first known vertebrates to have had jaws. Whilst first evolving in the previous Silurian period, it was during the Devonian that they became truly successful and diverse. Whilst long thought to have been a separate basal offshoot of the vertebrate family tree, the discovery of the placoderm genus Entelinathus in 2013 has suggested that they may actually not form a natural group and instead represent a progression towards all jawed vertebrates alive today. Dunkleosteus, whose name means Dunkel's bone, after the paleontologist David Dunkel, did not have teeth but rather sharp dental plates that were part of the jaws themselves for cutting into prey. 
It has been debated whether the dental plates would be covered by skin like some modern predatory fish, but I don't have an issue with the lack of lips in this reconstruction. It's thought to have utilised suction feeding, creating a vacuum to suck in water and prey, as well as having the estimated highest bite force of any living or extinct vertebrate. The model is awesome. If sadly outdated, as recently as 2023, as Dunkley Osteus is only known from the fossilised head armour, the total body length can only be estimated based on these parts. This model is based on the larger species, D. Torelli, estimated at around 10 metres long, but a 2023 paper grants a much smaller total length estimate of 4 to 8 metres. The orangey-red colour scheme is fantastic regardless. Nigel has the crew build a spherical cage for protection, as round shapes are much more difficult for biting jaws to gain purchase on. Nigel mentions that at this time, on land there are as yet no animals bigger than a centipede, which I suppose is correct if we're excluding semi-aquatic animals, such as the earliest four-legged vertebrates that may be ancestral to all terrestrial vertebrates that appeared at this time, such as Ichthyostega or Hynerpton, which we'll later see in Walking with Monsters. They never show land in this segment, but by the late Devonian, early trees, such as the genus Archaeopteris, would have formed the first forests, supporting some of the first terrestrial ecosystems, something we will also see in Walking with Monsters. So it's really cool that we get a good look at both the land and sea of the Devonian in Walking With, as it's an extremely significant time period for the evolution of vertebrates, and my personal favourite period of the Paleozoic era. Nigel then uses a fishing rod to catch another armour-plated fish to use as bait for another predator. This time it's a small placoderm fish. The book IDs this fish as Bothriolepis, an extremely common and successful genus that was able to live in both fresh and salt water. Its name means trench scale, and it was thought to have been a bottom feeder, eating detritus and small animals in the substrate, such as aquatic worms. It is only portrayed by a puppet, but it looks wonderful and very lifelike. Nigel points out the reason Dunkleosteus had such huge and powerful jaws and dental plates was because it had to pierce through the armour of other placoderms. He apparently made a bet with the other crew members that Dunkleosteus could also bite through an armoured fish if it was also wrapped in chainmail, because... Okay. It is a bit morbid to think Nigel basically condemns this Bothriolepis to death by Dunkley Osteus. At least the Astraspis was already dead. The cage is then lowered into the water, and Nigel swims into the cage with the bait. The first creature to arrive is a male Stethacanthus. Its name means chest spine, after the large, distinct dorsal fin of the males. Whilst Nigel refers to it as the ironing board shark, it is actually more closely related to the Chimeras. It looks pretty much perfect, except for maybe being a little bit too big, as the Devonian species, S. altonensis, averaged around 1.5 metres long. Stethacanthus is also known for having small spikes on both its head and bizarre dorsal fin, but the model here seems to be smooth in both cases. The purpose of these spikes is still unknown. Potential uses include mating displays, predator deterrents, or even for clamping to larger marine animals like modern remoras. I wouldn't be surprised if this model is also a slightly repurposed version of the Hybodus from Walking with Dinosaurs. The Stethacanthus is spooked off, however, by a Dunkleosteus. The detail of the reflection of the cage being visible in the dunk's eye as it swims past is incredible. This is a very tense scene as the placoderm begins to rattle the cage, desperately trying to get the bait. As the music swells and becomes more and more frantic, Nigel comments on some of the bars being bent as it charges directly towards the cage, marking the end of episode 1 with a cliffhanger. So, spoilers I guess. Episode 2, Into the Jaws of Death, reveals that the Dunkleosteus doesn't smash the cage, but just dents the bars, prompting Nigel to let the fish have the bait. The placoderm crushes through both the Bothriolepis' armour and the chainmail, meaning Nigel won his bets. Yay? Below the cage, a juvenile Dunkleosteus is seen scavenging on some of the scraps from the adult's feeding. 
Suddenly, the juvenile is ambushed by the adult, sliding across the seabed, kicking up a cloud of sand which looks amazing. We can morbidly hear the adult crunch through the juvenile's armour. I don't know whether Dunkleosteus was a cannibal, but bite marks have been found on their dermal armour, thought to have been inflicted by others of their own kind. Whether they actually fed upon these animals, however, is unknown. We then see the placoderm regurgitate the indigestible armour plating and the chainmail. The Devonian segment ends with the shot of the crewman crossing off the seas on the whiteboard I mentioned earlier, which has the Triassic listed first before transitioning to the time map. This segment is solid, all the creatures are wonderful, and it is genuinely tense when the Dunkleosteus is ramming the cage. Superb stuff. The fourth sea is the Eocene Epoch. Set 36 million years ago, Nigel mentions that we are in Egypt, meaning this part is set in the exact same time and place as part of the Walking with Beasts episode, Whale Killer. It starts out with Nigel trudging through the mangrove swamps that will become the Sahara Desert, known today as the Fayum Site. Interestingly, this part was actually filmed in the mangrove swamps on the coast of the Red Sea in Egypt, so is kind of shot on location, almost. He's on the trail of a land animal, strangely, finding footprints and getting maybe a bit too excited about some dung that apparently an Inuit would have taken a cheeky nibble out of, Nigel opts just for a sniff, deeming the maker as a fruit eater. Weirdly enough, the eerie ambience used here is the same as that used in the Five Nights at Freddy's horror game, of all things. We hear some deep bellows before seeing a male Arsinoetherium from the trees. This was an unusual mammal that inhabited the rainforests and mangrove swamps of North Africa during the late Eocene and early Oligocene epochs. Its name means Arsino's beast, after the ancient Egyptian pharaoh Arsino. Nigel says it best when he says that despite looking like a rhino, it is more closely related to the elephant, and more surprising still, is that it lived like a hippo. It was an embrithopod, an extinct group of Afrotheres, the group of mammals whose origins lie in Africa, such as elephants and manatees. The rhino-like horns and possible hippo-like lifestyle are simply cases of convergent evolution. In terms of accuracy, the only issue is that it has been given a small trunk that the real animal was not thought to have had. This leads me to believe that this is an artifact of it being based on the Merotherium model from Walking with Beasts, which also had a small trunk and similar skin texture. This is supported by the fact that some shots of the Merotherium swimming from Whale Killer are reused and mirrored, with horns added to the head of the model. Upon offering this creature an apple from the 21st century, the Arsinoetherium rejects Nigel's advances and charges. It eventually gives up the chase and heads into the water for a swim. Nigel then very quickly gets into scuba gear and dives with the amphibious mammal, and he is greeted by a small pod of Dorodon, who used the same model as those from Whale Killer. Since I already talked about these creatures in my review of that episode, I won't go over them again here, and instead provide a link to said video. Nigel teases that whilst he is here to find a whale, it is one that eats Dorodon for breakfast. So, I suppose this segment could be considered the least impressive, as it only includes one new creature, and it is very likely just a slight retooling of an already existing model. It is also difficult to be hyped for the reveal of the main sea monster for this part if you've seen Walking with Beasts, so it also doesn't have that going for it. Of course, the not-quite-mystery monster is Basilosaurus, also using the same model from Whale Killer. Nigel does give us some background on the animal in The Ancient Mariner, showing early artists' impressions and photos of its skull before showing the creature, which, if it is your first time seeing the creature, is honestly well built up. This segment has one of the most interesting methods for finding the sea monster. Recording the vocalisations of a nearby Bacillosaurus with a microphone, and then replaying them back through the water with a speaker, with the goal being to attract it by making it believe it's another whale. Bacillosaurus' ability to sing is very interesting, as it did not possess the resonating melon organ of modern toothed whales, but perhaps they were capable of vocalisations similar to modern baleen whales. 
they eventually record the song of a nearby Bacillosaurus, which uses the songs of modern humpbacks, quite different to the sounds used in Walking With Beasts. After replaying it through the speaker underwater, in time, they attract the whale, it bumps into the ship, rattling the crew. No, the oranges! They use footage of a modern whale's tail breaking the water's surface. Nigel quickly suits up and just clings to the boat, hoping its huge size will be enough to put off attack from the enormous predator. Its reveal is slow and really cool how the audience sees it before Nigel does. He comments on how it looks for all the world like a whale on diet pills, as it lacked blubber due to ocean temperatures in the Eocene being much higher than today's. Eventually the whale gets so irritated by the sounds, it bites off the speaker and shakes it like a terrier shaking a rat. Interestingly, the Eocene segment ends with the narration explaining how as Africa drifts northwards, the ancient Tethys Sea between it and Eurasia will disappear, and Bacillosaurus will disappear with it. This would imply that this is what caused the extinction of Bacillosaurus. But the genus is also known from outside the Tethys, and its extinction is thought to be related to the cooling climate, which was literally the plot of Whale Killer, so the wording is very strange. So this segment seems to have a few shortcomings compared to the others so far. Only one new creature, and it was only semi-aquatic. Whilst it only focuses on Bacillosaurus, like I said in my whale killer review, the lineage of mega-toothed sharks that would eventually lead to Megalodon, who we'll talk about later, were around in the late Eocene and were already very large, such as Otodus auriculatus, which was around 8 meters long, and may have been cool to have seen, but I can understand why they weren't, so as not to undermine the aforementioned Megalodon when it appears later. Despite this, it is actually my favourite segment, sheerly because of childhood nostalgia. This might seem quite random, but Into the Jaws of Death actually has a very special place in my heart, as one of my oldest memories was being four years old, watching this episode when it was first broadcast in 2003 on a tiny CRT TV. I can still remember after it finished, getting onto my bedroom floor and recreating the ESC mangroves, the Arsinoetherium, and Nigel and his apple out of Lego in the dark. I will forever treasure this memory, and this episode for this reason. Into the top three, the third deadliest sea is the Pliocene, though put a pin in that. Nigel states they are in Peru four million years ago. We get some awesome narration to hype us up before showing a cast of the jaws of the great white shark, before showing them being dwarfed by a cast of the jaws of Megalodon, the largest shark to have ever lived. Despite only being known from the teeth and jaws, estimates based on other shark species have put it at around 50 feet long. It seems very fitting the name Megalodon literally means big tooth. Fun fact, Nigel has the Megalodon Jaws prop attached to the side of his house, which is just awesome. When they set out to search for the giant shark, however, I like that we see disagreement amongst the crew as to whether they should search for an adult or a juvenile first. It's interesting that this creature is the one that has the crew undecided, perhaps because it's a shark which are alive today. So maybe some of the crew have experience with sharks and are anxious about a giant one. Eventually, they decide for Nigel to do a dive with juvenile sharks nearer the coast in a kelp bed. Interestingly, we have since found evidence of Megalodon using coastal mangrove swamps as nurseries for their young, so there is some merit in finding young Megalodon closer to the coast. Interesting that Nigel takes no form of protection, as even a young Megalodon could be lethal to a person. While searching for the shark, Nigel comes across the small cetacean Odobinosotops. This animal was once thought to have lived in the Pliocene, but is now thought to have only lived in the earlier Miocene epoch, but this wasn't discovered until after the show had aired. Speaking of, it truly is such a shame that the macroraptorial sperm whales, some of the largest predators in the history of the planet, were only discovered after the show aired, as they would have been amazing to see here, especially alongside Megalodon. I talk about these animals in depth in my Extinct Whales Were Terrifying video if you're interested in learning more about these awesome animals. 
These also only lived in the Miocene, and would therefore have made for an incredibly deadly sea if this segment was set in that epoch, and honestly could even displace the Cretaceous as number one. Sadly, the events went in the wrong order, but perhaps someday we can get a truly terrifying, but also educational and accurate, recreation of the Pisco Formation's deadly seas off the coast of Miocene, Peru. For the time though, this is still excellent. As for the Odobinocetops, the model is honestly wonderful and perfectly reflects this utterly bizarre tusked cetacean. Nigel suggests that this male's three foot long tusk would be used for jousting with other males. However, more recent studies suggest that the tusks would be too brittle and may have been used for sexual display or as a deterrent. As Nigel is enamoured at the Odobinocetops is slurping up shellfish and or worms from the seafloor, a juvenile megalodon suddenly appears out of nowhere, spooking the cetacean into hiding amongst the kelp. The shark oddly just doesn't notice it though. Nigel estimates the juvenile as being three years old and is already the size of a modern great white. Eventually the shark leaves and Nigel returns to the boat. It's honestly a great way to build up excitement for the eventual appearance of the gigantic adult later. Wanting to learn more about Megalodon, Nigel has the crew make a replica Odobinocetops, which is a really good double of the CG model actually. They attach a camera to the dummy and drag it out behind in a rubber dinghy. Eventually, the shark attacks the dummy, with the camera feed showing that it attacked from below and behind, like modern great whites. Nigel also speculates that Megalodon is closely related to Great Whites, and at the time, Megalodon was even in the genus Carcharodon, alongside the Great White Shark, Carcharodon Carcarius, as Carcharodon Megalodon, in the family Lamnidae, the mackerel sharks in the order Lamniforms. However, it is now separated into a different lineage of Lamniform sharks, often switching between the genera Carcharocles and Otodus but most recent studies appear to favour the latter genus. The lineage currently thought to lead to the Megalodon species originates back in the Cretaceous with the genus Cretolamna in the family Otodontidae. This genus is thought to be directly ancestral to the Cenozoic genus Otodus. The paper naming and describing the fellow Otodontid genus Megalolamna in 2016 suggested that many species sometimes assigned to the genus Carcharocles, including Megalodon in some literature, should be reassigned to the genus Otodus, potentially even synonymizing the two genera. All this to say, Megalodon is not as closely related to great whites as we once thought. Despite this, its portrayal as essentially a big, snub-nosed great white may actually be quite accurate. Though this is very difficult to determine due to the species only being known from jaws and teeth, due to shark skeletons mainly consisting of cartilage, which tends to not fossilise. Satisfied with what they've learned, the crew sail out into deeper water to dive with an adult. They plan to lure the shark with a large chum bag, like with modern sharks. Eventually, an adult megalodon arrives and... <sighs> Look, I can forgive scientific inaccuracies, but I cannot forgive the shark fin prop going backwards. My like, guys, come on, you have one job! Nigel reuses the round cage from the Devonian with the intent to attach a shark cam to the megalodon's dorsal fin, to document its activities and retrieve it later when it naturally dissolves and detaches from the animal. The reveal of the adult Megalodon is amazing, helped massively by Ben Bartlett's incredible score. It's genuinely really tense and I'm just still amazed to this day that this show manages to instill fear and it's not even a horror show. Seeing the shark attempting to bite the cage is still terrifying. I love how you can see remoras on the shark too, making it feel so much more believable. After Nigel deems it impossible to reach the dorsal fin from the cage, he somehow escapes off screen and uses a low platform on the ship instead by luring the shark below it. One of the crew foolishly raises the chum bag, whilst unaware of the megalodon's whereabouts. The giant shark then breaches the water's surface right in front of Nigel, and as it drops back into the waves, Nigel is gone. 
ending episode 2 on a cliffhanger as well. So, spoilers once again, I guess, for a 20-year-old show, the third and final episode, To Hell and Back, which features both a question mark and an ellipsis with five dots for some reason, starts out by showing that Nigel is fine, just knocked into the water to which he takes his anger out on the crew member by calling him an idiot. <gasps> Language. He climbs back onto the platform, and as the Megalodon swims past, he attaches the shark cam to its giant dorsal fin with a victory hop. The shark then swallows the chum bag as it departs. Note the fantastic detail of the eyes rolling back into the head to protect them with a thick membrane, something modern great whites also do during an attack. A few days later, the shark cam detaches from the Megalodon, and Nigel and the crew retrieve it in a dinghy to review the footage, once again on good old VHS. In the footage, we see the shark attack an unidentified species of whale different to Odobinosotops. The species is never identified in the show or any supplementary material, and you never really get a clear view of it but fans have speculated that it represents the successful and common baleen whale genus Cetotherium. This is a suitable candidate, however, Cetotherium is not known from Peru specifically, so I think it is more likely to be the fellow Cetothere genus Piscobalaena. Megalodon has long been suspected of feeding on whales, as fossil whale bones have been found with gashes thought to have been inflicted by the teeth of these giant sharks. The Pliocene segment then concludes with narration on how Megalodon became extinct due to the changing climate from the oncoming Ice Age, with their favoured prey migrating to the polar regions away from the warmer waters preferred by the sharks. This segment is wonderfully done. As I said before, it truly is a shame that the Macroraptorial sperm whales were only discovered after the show was made, as I would have loved to have seen them. The only other instance of them appearing in a documentary, as far as my knowledge goes, is in Jurassic Fight Club of all things. This segment should probably be the Miocene now, but for the time, it was correct, and I think it is wonderful intent. Brilliant stuff. The second deadliest sea is the Jurassic, set 155 million years ago meaning it actually takes place before both Time of the Titans and Cruel Sea from Walking with Dinosaurs. Interestingly, the book confirms this segment is set in England, just like the latter episode, and features two of the creatures from it, alongside two brand new ones, based on fossil finds from the Oxford Clay Formation. Once again, I'm guessing this segment was filmed either off the coast of New Zealand and or the Bahamas, the latter fittingly also being where they filmed some of Cruel Sea. Interestingly, this is also the only segment that starts with Nigel already underwater. This time around, he has a diver propulsion vehicle, or sea scooter. The theme for the Jurassic segment is large marine animals. As such, Nigel spots a shoal of the enormous ray-finned fish Leedsichthys. Here it is portrayed as a gigantic 27 meter long filter feeder. Whilst the interpretation of its lifestyle from its fossils is still considered to be the same, the size has changed considerably. When first discovered in England in the 1880s, the genus Leedsichthys was known from such fragmentary remains, they were first interpreted as the tail spikes of the stegosaur now known as Dacentrurus of all things. This was before famous, or infamous, American paleontologist Othniel Charles Marsh interpreted them as the skull bones of a large fish. Later discoveries included specimens consisting of over a thousand disarticulated pieces of bone. Due to the strange and confusing nature of its remains, it was named Leedsichthys problematicus, meaning Leeds' problematic fish, after its discoverer, Alfred Nicholson Leeds. Due to most of its skeleton being presumed to be made of cartilage, the bones that fossilised were oddly distributed across the body and became jumbled during fossilisation. Another specimen found in France was known only from the huge gill rakers, structures some fish have on their gills used to filter food from water they take in through the mouth and expel through the gills. From this, the total body length was extrapolated to be as short as 13 meters to as long as 30 meters. 
it is these estimations that this reconstruction is based on. More recent studies on the more recently discovered and most complete specimen known so far, from Chile, suggest total length estimates close to around 16 meters. Whilst not the utter behemoth to the degree we once thought it was, Lysicthes still holds the record for the largest known ray finned fish, even at this reduced size. Another error with this model is the head. It is shown to slope considerably towards the snout and is quite blunt. Whereas more modern reconstructions give it a much longer and a more gentle drop from the top of the head to the snout. Whilst it is outdated, it does perfectly portray the theme of enormous animals they were going for. And I'd be lying if I didn't think they were awesome. The music here is also superb. Their size is exemplified by how long it takes for Nigel to travel the entire length of the animal, even with a sea scooter. He spots one fish at the back of the shoal, struggling to keep up, and it is then attacked by some smaller predators. One of these is Metriorhynchus. Its name means moderate snout, and it was a member of the Thalatosuchia, a group descended from terrestrial reptiles related to crocodiles, fully adapted to living in aquatic ecosystems. They differed strongly from modern crocodilians. They had webbed feet, which were essentially flippers, a vertical tail fluke for swimming, and lacked osteoderm armor to become more streamlined. They lived from the early Jurassic to the early Cretaceous, and seem to have become extinct for reasons that are unclear. In the book, it is stated that Metriorhynchus would only return to land to lay its eggs. However, it is now thought to be more likely they gave live birth out at sea, which would be a unique trait among archosaurs, the group of reptiles including crocodiles, dinosaurs and birds. The actual model itself looks amazing, and basically perfect accuracy wise. However, the genus Metriorhynchus has in recent years been deemed a wastebasket taxon, and so many specimens assigned to it have since been reclassified. As of 2023, the only specimens referred to Metriorhynchus are known from France. The specimen discovered in the Oxford clay is now referred to the new genus, Thalatosuchus, meaning sea crocodile. But this was named years after production had ended, so for the time, it is basically flawless. When it goes to take a bite out of Nigel, he just sort of swats it away? The other smaller predator attracted is a familiar face from Cruel Sea, but this time it does actually get name dropped, Hybodus. Oh boy, speaking of wastebasket taxons, this is a big one. Despite being called a shark both here and in Walking with Dinosaurs, the genus Hybodus is a member of the Hybodontiforms, a group of cartilaginous fish related to true sharks and rays, but are their own distinct lineage. This group existed from the Devonian period all the way to the end of the Cretaceous, meaning they spent just under 300 million years on the Earth. As is typical of fish whose skeletons consist mostly of cartilage, they are mostly known just from teeth. As such, assigning them to specific genera can be difficult. As a result, many hybodont teeth were assigned to the genus Hybodus, to a point where the genus appeared to persist from the late Permian all the way to the end of the Cretaceous, an extremely long amount of time for any genus to exist for. In the mid to late 2010s, the genus Hybodus was reassessed and many species were reassigned to other genera. Even the original holotype specimen for Hybodus have not been well studied and require reassessment. Because of all this confusing taxonomy, I have no idea what to say about this animal's accuracy or whether it should be present here. Hybodont teeth are apparently known from the Oxford clay, but whether these belong to the genus Hybodus is unknown. Regardless, it and the Metriorhynchus begin to eat the weak Lytichthys alive. A grim scene, but it's a great inclusion, as it's just nature. I like that we see the Metriorhynchus perform a death roll when it bites off a piece of the Lytichthys, a signature of its crocodilian family ties. Nigel teases that he hasn't even seen the massive marine reptile he's here to see yet, and that it is almost as large as Lydzichthys. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. Back on the Ancient Mariner, Nigel introduces us to the acoustic tracking system, detecting the signal of the injured Lydzichthys from earlier. 
Later, a 4 flippered signal is detected, which Nigel IDs as a Lyplurodon, coming to feed on the Leedsick Thieves. Impossible Pictures must have felt obligated to stay consistent with its portrayal as a 25 meter behemoth in Walking with Dinosaurs, even though the only body fossils confidently assigned to the genus Lyplurodon are closer to 6 meters. Fragmentary remains of large pliosaur genera have been found, most notably the Monster of Aramberry from the late Jurassic of Mexico, which was initially referred to the genus Lyplurodon and was reported by the media as being a juvenile and already being 15 meters long when it was first discovered in 1985. These claims have since been dismissed, as the specimen has not been formally described and so cannot be referred to the genus Lyplurodon, and comparisons with the Cretaceous Pliosaur genus Cronosaurus from Australia has yielded higher size estimates. The monster of Aramberry may still be a very large pliosaur, but it is not Lyplurodon. But the myth of the latter genus being a truly enormous monstrosity persists to this day. Aside from size, plesiosaurs are also now thought to have had small tail flukes. Nigel then has one of the crew use a camera mounted on a pole to see the light pleuridon feeding on the now dead Leedsichthys before scaring it off. Nigel then shows us some footage from some experiments the crew carried out involving chemicals to use for a smell suit, a scuba suit Nigel plans to wear whilst diving with Lyplurodon that will release a foul-smelling chemical into the water with the intent to dissuade potential predators. These tests were carried out in shallow water and involved weighing down a human dummy to the seabed with squid attached to lure in juvenile Lyplurodon, which, fun fact, seemed to be pretty close to the actual size of Lyplurodon. I wonder if that was intentional. They decide on the chemical putrescine, as it seemed to have the strongest effect on the juveniles, hoping it will do the same with the adults. We then get one of the coolest scenes in the show, as we have the only nighttime dive, as a pair of Lyplurodon have come to feed on the Leedsichthys carcass. I love how Nigel dives loudly into the water, whilst his cameraman just gently dips his head under. We see the Leetichthys has transformed into a practical model, as it is ripped into by the two pliosaurs. Not much happens in this scene, as it is just watching two Lyplurodon eating a big dead fish, but the light provided from the boat piercing down through the pitch black water from above creates the coolest looking dive in the show in my opinion. There's a neat touch here where you can see a Lyplurodon swallow a floating chunk of flesh in the background. Nigel boldly moves in very close to the feeding frenzy, and one of the predators gets a bit too close and sets off the smell suit, releasing an orange cloud into the water, adding to the awesome visual flair. The segment ends with Nigel rocketing to the surface as the narration reminds us that all that remains is the most dangerous sea ever. I really love this segment a lot, and it's actually more time appropriate for the animals featured than Cruel Sea was, as all were present 155 million years ago, minus the quote unquote Hybodus, maybe. The nighttime dive with the Lyplurodon and the smell suit is a definite highlight. The seventh and final sea is the late Cretaceous, 75 million years ago. It is set in Kansas, which at the time was covered by the Western Interior Seaway, an inland sea that split North America into two landmasses. Nigel calls this place Hell's Aquarium, and it might just be the coolest and most fitting name ever. Based on the location, age and fauna, this segment is most likely based on fossil finds from the Pierre Shale Formation, and it is so rich with interesting animals, it could honestly fill an entire 30 minute episode alone. As such, this segment stars the most creatures out of all of them, with a whopping 9 different animals. I believe this part was also filmed around New Zealand, and it seems to have a strange brown-beige filter over it for some reason. The segment starts out with Nigel amongst a noisy colony of Hesperornis. Its name means Western Bird, and it was an early flightless bird that was roughly 2 meters long and convergently evolved a very similar lifestyle to modern penguins. Unlike them, however, their wings were tiny and essentially vestigial, and so would have swum by using their powerful legs. It is still unknown whether Hesperonis had lobed feet like grebes, as the model scene here shows, or webbed feet like ducks. 
it differed from modern birds in another way in that it retained teeth within its beak, which in the lower jaw extend to the end of the beak, but in the upper jaw stop partway down its length. It's tough to spot, but this is correctly reconstructed here, which is fantastic. It is still debated whether Hesperornis was capable of walking on land like penguins, or whether it was too heavy and had to drag itself on its belly, similar to loons. Here, the belly dragging hypothesis is favoured, and I don't have an issue with it. Overall, this model and portrayal of Hesperornis is still fantastic to this day. There's a shot here very reminiscent of one used in Cruel Sea of the Cryptoclidus being composited on top of penguins hunting sardines, and the same may have been done here but with Hesperornis. Nigel explains that the reason this sea is more dangerous than the others is that there isn't just one extremely dangerous predator, there are several, most of which would be lethal to a human. Nigel then heads out in a dinghy to investigate a bloodbath near the coast with a periscope, within which he spots an unidentified species of shark. Sharks were extremely successful during the Cretaceous, many of which were generalist predators. This one just uses a smaller version of the Megalodon model, and its identity is never officially confirmed. However, the book mentions the genus Squalicorax, aka the Crow Shark, as its name means Shark Raven. It has been found in the Pierre Shale, and judging from its size, appears to be the best candidate. It was a medium sized shark at around 3 meters long, and appears to have been extremely successful and widespread. However, this may be due to it being a wastebasket taxon for many similar morphs of shark teeth, which look strikingly similar to the modern tiger shark, despite not being closely related. Okay, so I'm doing a bit of post commentary here, as I came to a realisation whilst editing the audio for this part of the video, and that is that considering this shark uses the Megalodon model, another candidate for its identity would be its possible Cretaceous ancestor I mentioned earlier, Cretolamna, also known from the Pierre Shale. Its name means chalk shark, after the chalk deposits its fossils have often been found in. Recent research indicates it would have looked similar to the modern poor beagle shark. Alright, and back to past Hodge. Nigel then spots another carnivorous fish, Zephactinus. Its name means sword ray, and it was a six meter long hyper carnivorous ray finned fish, which we have fossil evidence proving it was a voracious predator that would swallow very large prey whole. The fish within a fish specimen on display in the Sternberg Museum of Natural History in Kansas shows a Zephactinus preserved with another fish, Gillicus, inside it, meaning it swallowed the huge fish whole and died shortly after. This appetite and behaviour is portrayed here as we see one swallowing a Hesperornis whole. The model looks amazing, and it is still perfect in terms of accuracy 20 years later. The coloration is, ironically, beautiful for such a grotesque fish, with a purple body and red tail and countershaded light underbelly. The bulging glassy eyes are also a fantastic detail, just a magnificent portrayal of the bulldog fish. Nigel also spotted a small species of mosasaur, which is accompanied by a very distinct sound leitmotif that I'm not sure what to call. If any of you know better than me, please do let me know in the comments. He states that they were the ruling class of marine reptiles in the Cretaceous, which is correct for the latter part of the period, as the pliosaurs and macro-predatory ichthyosaurs didn't become extinct until around 90 million years ago, just over halfway through the Cretaceous, due to the Cenomanian Turonian Oceanic Anoxic event a period of volcanism that caused the oceans to experience severe drops in oxygen, having a domino effect on both aquatic and terrestrial food webs. The resulting niche vacuum at the top of the food chain, caused by their extinction, was then filled by a group of terrestrial lizards, gradually becoming more adapted to an aquatic lifestyle, the mosasaurs. The immense seafloor spreading caused by this volcanism also pushed sea levels to the highest they have been in the entire Phanerozoic Eon, creating many shallow inland seas, perfect habitat for mosasaurs. Mosasaurs were very diverse in terms of size and lifestyle. This smaller species seen near the coast is never named in the show, but the book IDs it as the genus Halisaurus, whose name means ocean lizard. 
Strangely though, Hallisaurus is not definitively known from Kansas or the segment setting of 75 million years ago. The model is also identical to the other Mosasaur genus we'll see later, and as a result, the proportions and skull shape are not quite right for Hallisaurus, as the torso appears to be too long. It was also thought to be a more basal Mosasaur, as its flippers were also not as well adapted to aquatic locomotion as other forms, appearing quite similar to the functional feet of their terrestrial ancestors, yet here look like the highly derived flippers of other Mosasaurs. All of these factors combined would make the genus Clydastes a more appropriate replacement, so unfortunately this model is not the best I'm afraid. This is also not mentioning the discovery made years after production had ended that mosasaurs had tail flukes similar to fish and ichthyosaurs and would have swum more like them, as opposed to the more eel-like motion that had been thought previously. Of course, I can't hold this against this model as the discovery was made long after the series aired. We then get a really strange cameo, the Tyrannosaurus from Death of a Dynasty just standing on the coast, roaring out at the sea. Not only would T-Rex have not evolved by this time, it also contradicts what was said in Death of a Dynasty, which was at the very end of the Cretaceous 65 million years ago, even though it's since been pushed back to 66 million, where it states that it evolved in the last 2 million years. It would therefore make much more sense if it was a different genus of Tyrannosaur that lived at the time, but which depends heavily on the geography. Whilst the popular choice for this seems to be Daspletosaurus, as it was a heavily built tyrannosaur that lived in North America 75 million years ago, based on the maps I've seen, Kansas at this time was either completely submerged or only its eastern side was above water. Daspletosaurus was only known from the western North American landmass, Laramidia. The eastern landmass, Appalachia, however, was home to a different member of the tyrannosaur family tree. Whilst not known from Kansas specifically, the Tyrannosaur Appalachiosaurus is known from the eastern landmass and from the Campanian stage of the Cretaceous, which dates from 83 to 72 million years ago. As the ancient mariner sails into deeper water to find giant mosasaurs, Nigel states that he will not actually be diving in the sea as it is too dangerous, as he shows us the many pieces of safety equipment for sailing in Hell's Aquarium. The acoustic tracking device returned from the Jurassic, forwards and backwards facing underwater cameras on the bow of the boat, and lastly a submersible ROV with built-in cameras to safely film any giant mosasaurs. As the awesome music kicks in, we see a pteranodon soaring over Hell's Aquarium, which is technically also a returning creature as it first appeared in Chased by Dinosaurs, but it was so out of place there that this feels much more like its true appearance. Its name means toothless wing, and whilst it is known from Kansas, it is only known from the older Niobrara formation dated to around 85 million years ago. So sadly, it may have become extinct by this time, but it is possible we just haven't found it yet in the younger Pierre Shale. I already talked about its inaccuracies in my Land of Giants review, which you can watch here, and they are all still present here sadly, at least now it's in the right location. As it goes to inaccurately skim the water's surface to catch smaller fish, it narrowly dodges a Zephactinus as it lunges out of the water to try and catch it. Shark teeth have been found embedded in the bones of some pteranodon specimens, however whether this represents active hunting or just scavenging is unknown. The next morning, something hits the ancient mariner with what Nigel calls a tremendous clunk. It is revealed to be the front half of a dead giant sea turtle that has been bitten in two, represented by a fantastic and gory puppet with very believable looking wounds. Nigel explains that the only thing that could have done such devastating damage is a giant mosasaur. This is such a cool way to build suspense for the main star of this segment by showing the damage it can cause before actually seeing it. The crew set sail once more, and the Pteranodon has decided to roost on the Ancient Mariner, as Nigel feeds it a small fish. The sonar picks up some signals of large animals moving under the boat. The cameras show that it is a pod of the plesiosaur Elasmosaurus, and send the ROV out for a better look. 
the elasmosaurids first evolved in the early Cretaceous and took the basic bowel plan of earlier long-necked plesiosaurs, such as Cryptoclidus, and took it to the extreme. Not only did they grow much larger than their relatives in the Jurassic, their necks grew proportionally longer too, with the genus Albertonectes possessing the greatest number of neck vertebrae in the animal kingdom at a whopping 76 vertebrae. They are thought to have retained the same hunting strategy of hunting small fish by sneaking their small heads into shoals of fish with their long necks so as not to scare them off with their huge bodies and then trap them in their jaws with their sharp teeth. Like with the Lyplurodon, plesiosaurs are now thought to have had small tail flukes but this was discovered after the show aired so I won't criticise the model for it. What I will criticise this model for is the head and neck. It just looks so strange. It looks like they took the head of the Nothosaurus, stretched the neck out and put it on a different body. The neck looks so skinny and the head ends up looking very bulbous on the end of it. The body too may be a bit too bulky, but perhaps it just looks that way compared to the spindly neck. The genus Elasmosaurus, whose name means thin plate reptile, is actually famous for being one of the sparks that ignited the fierce rivalry between American paleontologists Ofniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope, called the Bone Wars, which lasted from 1877 to 1892. When Cope first described and named the animal in 1868, Marsh mocked him by pointing out that he had reconstructed the animal with the head on the wrong end, giving it a short neck and long tail. Furious and publicly humiliated, Cope sought to outdo Marsh by naming more extinct genera than him. These two feuding paleontologists resulted in the discovery and naming of many of the most famous extinct animals we know today but in their petty desperation created a huge mess of names attached to the smallest amount of fossil material that scientists are still trying to clear up over a century later. Speaking of, Elasmosaurus is actually not known from very complete remains, as many Elasmosaurid specimens were once placed into the genus Elasmosaurus, but have since been reassigned. Its fellow Pierre Shale Elasmosaurid, Styxosaurus, is known from much more complete specimens, and so many reconstructions of Elasmosaurus are mostly based on Styxosaurus. The book estimates their length at 15 meters, but most modern reconstructions are closer to 10 meters, seven of which were just the neck. So overall, not the best reconstruction of this animal, but you could certainly do worse. I love that they're shown riding the ship's bow wave to conserve energy, a method many animals today also use. The ROV then spots a living giant sea turtle, Archelon. Its name means early turtle, and it was a member of the extinct Protostegid family, thought to be most closely related to the modern leatherback sea turtles, but this is debated. They evolved at the beginning of the Cretaceous and became extinct at the end of the period in the KPG extinction event. Archelon was the largest of this group at 4.5 meters long and is probably the largest turtle known to science, though the unrelated genus Stupendamus from the Miocene is also a close contender but it lived in freshwater, so Archelon still holds the title for largest known sea turtle. It and other protostegids were thought to have had a leathery carapace like modern leatherbacks, rather than a bony shell like other turtles. It had a huge sharp beak, thought to be used for crushing shelled prey such as crustaceans and mollusks, but may have had a more varied diet if it was sufficient enough to slice meat as well. The bottom part of its shell, the plastron, was very dense, suggesting it may have spent much of its time on the sea floor as a bottom feeder. Both the CGI model and puppet look wonderful. Sadly, we never see it feeding at all, so it's impossible to comment on its ecology. Strangely, it's the sight of a living Archelon that makes Nigel change his mind about diving in this sea. As such, he heads out in a dinghy, waiting for the turtle to come up for air, and dives in with no method of defence to ride on one. Nigel states that the ROV should spot any danger, but I don't understand how that's helpful if he's underwater and the crew can't contact him to warn him of any potential predators. 
To probably nobody's surprise, the sonar tracker picks up something big approaching Nigel as the music gets very tense with very sudden piano hits. The captain radios the dinghy crew to get Nigel out of the water and they struggle to find him. Meanwhile, Nigel releases the Archelon and shoots to the surface as a Zephactinus menacingly circles below him. Upon scrambling back into the dinghy, Nigel radios the captain to tell them they're heading back. En route, however, the boat is capsized and the Pteranodon is most concerned. The ROV footage reveals the culprit behind the great dinghy flipping of 75 million BC to be a giant mosasaur. With Nigel being a bit occupied, the narration here is done by Karen Haley. She states that these mosasaurs are around 60 feet long, while some extrapolated estimates for the genus Mosasaurus are considered to be around this length, the Complete Guide to Prehistoric Life confirms this model is the genus Tylosaurus, whose name means protuberance lizard, which more modern estimates of one of the larger species, T. proriga, place as closer to 40 feet. Still enormous, though not quite as gigantic as shown here. As well as the previously mentioned outdated lack of a tail fluke, Mosasaurs are now known to have mostly been dark grey or black with a countershaded lighter underbelly rather than the light brown colour seen here. I do still quite like the patterning though. Perhaps the biggest issue here though is that the narration states that giant mosasaurs travelled in family groups to protect their young. There is no evidence to support this though, and in fact there is evidence of conflict between large mosasaurs as bite marks have been found on their skulls inflicted by other mosasaurs. On the whole though, I think this Tylosaurus model is really solid for the time. I have to say, it is really awesome seeing these giant sea monsters lunge up out of the water trying to attack the crew and all the upturned boat. Their interactions with the water look magnificent. I especially love this last shot of one of the flippers slapping the surface like, ah, fooey, as Nigel and the crew climb aboard the Ancient Mariner to safety. You can just barely make out Nigel saying, there's still blood in the water there as well yet we never see any blood when the crew is capsized. Perhaps that scene at the very beginning of the show, introducing the Deadly Seas, where we saw the Zephactinus get attacked by a Mosasaur, really did happen after all, just off screen? Regardless, the credits roll, but as the crew sleep, the tracker starts beeping like crazy with readings, as an entire armada of Mosasaurs approaches, with one eating the camera, an ending very reminiscent of that from Land of Giants with the Sarkasuchus, something director Jasper James is seemingly a fan of. The final Cretaceous segment is awesome in my opinion. It is a bit dated now in some regards, and I do feel some corners may have been cut when it came to the models, as many were reused both from this show or from others. But this is such a rich ecosystem that I can understand why they'd want to pack in as many fascinating animals as they could. Out of this batch of seven deadly seas, I do think this was definitely the deadliest, simply because there are so many predators. We also know from element dating that these predators were all contemporaries too, and don't represent separate sequential periods of sediment being deposited over time with different fauna. It truly was Hell's Aquarium. With all of the seas now covered, seeing as the entire premise of the show was seeing the supposed deadliest seas of all time and comparing them to one another, I figured it would be a fun and interesting thought experiment to evaluate whether I agree with the producers' order and go over what I might change. Sticking with the batch of seven the show went for, I definitely agree that the Order Vision is the least dangerous by a pretty hefty margin. Neither the sea scorpions of this time or orthocones pose much of a threat to a human, despite how large the latter could get. Am I wrong in thinking that? If I were to choose the seven deadliest seas throughout geological history and had no production or entertainment constraints, I would probably replace the order vision altogether with either the Carboniferous for Edestus or the Oligocene for the species of the shark genus Otodus, ancestors of Megalodon, which were still pretty huge, plus cetaceans like Ankyloriza and or Squalodontids. 
The Triassic, I think, is also pretty spot on with its placement too at number six, as other than the macro predatory ichthyosaurs like Symbospondylus, there doesn't seem to be much else in the water that would pose a significant threat to a human. The Devonian is an interesting one, as the predatory placoderms with their dental plates designed to pierce through armour, even the smaller or medium sized ones would be almost overbuilt for injuring a human, as they would probably be able to slice off limbs, or in the case of Dunkleosseus, cut you in half. Apologies for the grim mental images, but I'm simply analysing the potential threats, and as such I think it definitely ranks above the Triassic. The Eocene is another interesting case, as the only predator focused on in the show was Bacillosaurus. However, there were other predators that would be potentially lethal to a human, such as the 12 meter long basal baleen whale Larnocetus and the 8 meter long shark species Otodus auriculatus I mentioned earlier. There was also the giant snake Gigantophis in Egypt that would have lived in the mangrove swamps that could have also killed a human, so I think this does make it deadlier than the Devonian. The Pliocene is a tricky one, as like I said earlier, if it were the Miocene with our modern understanding of extinct sperm whales, then it would be a serious contender for number one. However, the Pliocene only really has Megalodon as a massive threat to a human. Still, this is a significant threat to a human at several growth stages. Whether I would rank it as third, I'm not quite sure. As, like I said with the Eocene, even though they weren't shown in the show, it would have also had extremely large sharks, albeit not quite as huge as Megalodon, but still massive on top of the huge predatory whales and snake, so I think I might actually place the Pliocene below the Eocene, and maybe even the Devonian. Yeah, I was surprised by that too. The Miocene though, would be bare minimum second place, if not number one. For the Jurassic, I think the main reason it was placed so high was because of the false giant like Pluridon bumping up the danger. Its larger relative, Pliosaurus, also from the Jurassic, was around 10 meters long, and even the real life 6 meter long like Pluridon was still a deadly predator in its own right, and would be absolutely lethal to a human. Some of the Metriorhynchids would have also provided a significant threat to a human, such as Plesiosuchus, which is actually estimated to be longer than Lyplurodon, oddly enough. Keep in mind, this is only discussing the late Jurassic. The early Jurassic had the huge macro-predatory ichthyosaur Temnodontosaurus, but I understand why they didn't include it, as they already had a large ichthyosaur with Symbospondylus in the Triassic, as well as already having assets for the late Jurassic from Cruel Sea, so it would have been easier from a production standpoint. All of these predators would most likely have preyed on animals of roughly similar size to a human, so the Jurassic was definitely a dangerous sea for a person. I think I would place it above the Pliocene and the Devonian, but not the Eocene. The Cretaceous is number one, and of this bunch of seven seas, it is not even close in my opinion. Mosasaurs of a staggering variety of sizes, good sized sharks, and Zephactinus, all living in the same sea, all lethal to a person. Hell's Aquarium deserves to be number one, and I genuinely feel that the only thing that could challenge it is our current understanding of the Miocene. So I guess my personal ranking would look something like this. I'm quite surprised by both how low the Pliocene and how high the Eocene ended up, honestly. Do you disagree? Let me know how you'd rank the seven deadly seas in the comments below. So on the whole, Sea Monsters is still solid 20 years later. I think the more dread-inducing tone of this show works fantastically, and really makes it stand out amongst the other Walking With shows. Like I said at the beginning, I usually don't like when paleomedia tries to make extinct animals seem like scary monsters, but I think Sea Monsters does it in an effective, believable, educational, and tasteful way, not just as an excuse to show creatures violently ripping each other to pieces, like some other paleo media out there. For the time, accuracy wise, it was really good overall, and most of it still is. 
There are some exceptions, like the quote-unquote Coelurosaur and the giant Lyplurodon bleeding over from walking with dinosaurs, which were not even competently supported at the time, never mind two decades later. On that note, some stuff has inevitably become outdated, such as the size of the Dunkleosteus and the lack of tail flukes on the Mosasaurs and Plesiosaurs, but that just comes with the territory of paleontology and media that's now two decades old. Needless to say, but Nigel is spectacular as always. You really can tell he was born to do this. The show is also really creative with how every die feels unique with a different method of defense for Nigel to use. It keeps the show interesting and exciting. The effects are also amazing, even 20 years later. The creatures' interactions with the water and environments are all superb. I love this show. I always have, and probably always will. It's very hard to remove my nostalgia goggles for this one. So, it's difficult to say if this is my favourite Walking With show. As a kid, it was between this and Walking With Beasts. However, as I've aged, I've learned to truly appreciate the magic of Walking With Dinosaurs. So, that one is probably my favourite. But this could easily change. Sea Monsters is still fantastic, and another worthy addition to the Walking With collection, and acts as a wonderful return to form after the kind of disappointing Walking With Cavemen and its quirks. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys next time. Bye bye now.